no nation which expects to be the leader of other nations can expect to stay behind in this race for space. Hello and welcome to the Terran Space Academy, where we help prepare you for a bright future in the space industry. Please don't forget to like and subscribe, and thank you for your support on Patreon. We appreciate you. It is my dream that someday, every nation on Earth will have easy access to space, even those that are landlocked. I want to be able to drive to a spaceport in the middle of the United States and enter a spacecraft that can take me into orbit and on to the moon or Mars. The only way to do this safely is with horizontal launch and landing space planes. And to understand why, we need to look back at the United Kingdom in the 1960s. After World War II, the United States did not have the most advanced aircraft industry. That appellation went to Britain and Canada in the Western world, and the Soviet Union in the East. Britain had started development of its own orbital rocket system, called Black Arrow. The Black Arrow rocket satellite launch system was derived from the Black Knight missile, seen here with its Gamma 301 engines. The Black Arrow was a three-stage rocket system, which was 13 meters tall and 2 meters in diameter at the base. It had a mass of a little more than 18 metric tons, and the first stage engine was called the Gamma 8. This engine used 85% high-test peroxide for an oxidizer with a silver-plated nickel-gauze catalyst that would help turn the H2O2 into superheated steam and oxygen. This would then combine with RP-1 and start burning. This engine had eight combustion chambers seen here, with four pairs of nozzles that gimbled with the chambers. This is considered a single engine, as from what I can find it used a single turbo pump, sort of like the RD-170 with four chambers and nozzles was considered a single engine, and the RD-180 with two. The Gamma-8 had an 8 to 1 oxidizer to fuel ratio and produced a total of 256 kilonewtons. It had a specific impulse of 251 seconds at sea level and would burn for 120 to 140 seconds. After first stage burnout and separation, the second stage, also called Black Knight because it was developed from the missile, would fire. Here you can see the Gamma-2 engine for the second stage. This was a two-chamber engine with extended nozzles for better expansion in vacuum. This engine also used high-test peroxide and RP-1 and had a thrust of 68 kilonewtons each with a specific impulse of 265 seconds. This engine could also gimbal in all axes and would burn for about 257 seconds. After burnout, the rocket would then coast to apogee where the fairing would open and the third stage would fire. The third stage was called Sustainer and would be released from the second stage payload fairing. The third stage had a wax wing solid rocket motor which would burn for 55 seconds. The first suborbital test launch failed, but the second one was successful. The third launch failed due to a leak in the second stage oxidizer pressurization system. But on 28 October 1971, the Black Arrow roared to space. It had launched from the Woomera Launch Complex in Australia, carrying the Prospero X-3 satellite onto orbit, where it remains today. The Black Arrow rocket system was designed to be a British satellite launch vehicle, and its success made the United Kingdom one of the few countries in the world at that time with an indigenous satellite launch capability. But despite the success of the Black Arrow program, it was cancelled shortly after this one successful launch. The United Kingdom government faced budget constraints and the cost of maintaining a space launch program was considered too high, especially given the limited number of satellite launches they expected at that time. The Black Arrow program was officially cancelled in 1972, making Britain the only nation in history to cancel its only successful launch system. But every failure is an opportunity to try something new. And this shutdown left Britain with some very frustrated engineers. In 
capable of building rockets and very advanced jet engines. And this brings us to the 1980s, when Britain again realized it wanted its own access to space. This is the HOTOL, which stands for Horizontal Takeoff and Landing Spacecraft. This was a British space plane concept developed in the 1980s and early 1990s. It was envisioned as a reusable single-stage-to-orbit space plane, designed to provide cost-effective access to low-Earth orbit. The development of HOTOL was led by a British aerospace company called British Aerospace, now best known as BAE Systems, in collaboration with Rolls-Royce and British Aerospace Space Systems. Here are the key stages and details of the development of the HOTOL spacecraft. The HOTOL concept was conceived in the early 1980s as a response to the increasing costs associated with traditional expendable launch vehicles. Britain was then at the mercy of what other nations wanted to charge to launch its satellites. And the goal was to create a space plane that could take off and land horizontally from conventional runways, reducing the cost of access to space. To make this possible, Hotol was designed to use a unique air-breathing engine called Sabre. Sabre stands for Synergistic Air-Breathing Rocket Engine. And this engine was intended to operate like a jet engine in the lower atmosphere, where it would take in air for combustion, and then it would transition to rocket mode in the vacuum of space, using onboard liquid oxygen for propulsion. The spacecraft was envisioned to be fully reusable capable of carrying payloads into LEO and returning to Earth, with a planned payload capacity of around 7 metric tons. Developing the Sabre engine was one of the most significant technical challenges. The engine needed to operate in both air-breathing and rocket modes, which required innovative heat exchanger technology to cool the incoming air rapidly. This posed several engineering hurdles, but over time, each of these problems was solved. I'm here with Richard Varville on the Reaction Engines uh, stand. Um, could you tell us uh, an idea of, of what you do at Reaction Engines and uh, perhaps then describe this wonderful model to us? Okay, I'm the technical director and I sort of was one of the founding directors when the company was set up in uh, 1990. Uh, this is the model of the Sabre engine. It's only fifth scale, so the real engine is pretty large. It's nearly four and a half metres diameter at the base. And very powerful engine. It generates uh, 150 tonnes of thrust in... Uh, rocket mode and 100 tons of thrust in air breathing mode okay. and it's uh, a unique engine designed to propel a single stage to orbit space plane called Skylon uh, into orbit, it does its business, releases its payload or whatever it's doing and re-enters and comes back and it can do that 200 times. Could you talk us through the various components of the engine? Okay, well, if you imagine you start off with the best uh, rocket engine that you know how to build. So this would be a LOX hydrogen rocket engine with a high chamber pressure and a good area ratio to give maximum and specific impulse uh, for the rocket mode. And then you're trying to find a way of improving its fuel consumption uh, a little bit in order to make single stage to orbit viable. And the only way of doing that is to use air instead of liquid oxygen. Uh, for the early phases of the flight. So this other equipment here is all associated with its air breathing capability. So you're looking at an intake here at the front which can accept up to 400 kilograms per second of air. The air then finds its way through the intake and is now traveling subsonically and flows down this annular space here and then flows into the engine through this large drum-like structure which is a big heat exchanger which we call a pre-cooler. And uh, this is basically using indirectly the, uh, the low temperature of the liquid hydrogen fuel as a heat sink via a clever thermodynamic cycle which I won't go into in too much detail. Um, so anyway, this basically, this feature here cools the air down so in a few milliseconds that it takes for the air to flow in through these thousands of small tubes, the air can get cooled from perhaps a thousand degrees centigrade at Mach 5 on the outside down to about minus 150 here on the inside, at which point you can then compress it to very high pressures in this sort of jet engine style compressor. Uh, this has a pressure ratio of 150 to 1, which is about five times higher than a normal sort of jet engine. And the air then comes out of the compressor down this line here at around 150 bar and can make its way into the actual rocket combustion chambers, which are running at about 103 bar. And then it's combined with the hydrogen or heated and uh, expelled out the back. So, in a nutshell, that's how this engine works in its sort of air breathing mode. And would there be one of these engines on a Skylon or two? Well, there's two, there's one on each wingtip. 
each engine has is quite complicated as you can see there's basically one air breathing engine inside each cell but two rocket engines uh, for redundancy reasons and what are these sort of side shoots coming out? These features here are part of a bypass system because the, the air mass flow that the core engine can accept is roughly independent of back number. But the air flow coming in through the intake actually peaks at around transonic Mach 1 and then decays sort of exponentially uh, with Mach number. So what we do is we, uh, we spill the excess air down this bypass duct here and it's then the air, in order to recover some thrust from it, the air is heated by combustion with some of the hydrogen fuel flow uh, in these burners here, and then it's banded out of the uh, bypass nozzles. And can you give us an idea of, of where you are in, in the production of this? Have you run any tests on...? It's, it's a concept study supported by a lot of technology development. In that cabinet there, out of camera shot, is a development pre-cooler module, because in the aerospace industry, no one has ever tried to make a, a big heat exchanger like this down to the sort of weight requirements that we need to make this project viable. And Reaction Engine spends a lot of time doing the technology development on that. Mm. And uh, can you give us any idea of timescales when we might see something actually? Well, when the, when the project starts for real, it will be about uh, 12 to 15 years of engineering development before you have an actual viable vehicle that you could uh, start operating in. Could you give us a sort of uh, history of reaction engines and give us an idea of the size of the company and so on? Well, like a lot of sort of tiny sort of fledgling uh, companies, we started with three founding directors, myself, Alan Bond, and a character called John Scott Scott. And uh, we were all ex Rolls Royce engineers. And uh, when we started, we were sort of from <laughs> working from home. Uh, it was just at the beginning of the sort of PC revolution, and we, we bought ourselves a couple of state of the art Amstrad computers with twin. Uh, double floppy drives and uh, of course I mean such computers these days are obviously um, sort of completely antiquated but back then you know it gave an engineer outstanding sort of power if you like to do sort of calculations that would have taken hundreds of people previously and we set about redesigning the vehicle uh, which transitioned from Hosol into Skylon and the RB545 engines which were the original engines on Hosol sort of evolved into these engines which we call Sabre. So we started off working from home and then eventually uh, managed to uh, attract enough investment to set up offices and facilities and okay. that's where we are today. Are you, are you funded uh, at all by government or is it purely private investors? That Not to date but we're hoping to change that in the near future. So. Okay. And uh, are there any uh, sort of milestones or uh, goals on the horizon? Uh, over the next three years we're going to make a 9% scale uh, pre-cooler, this feature here. Uh, and run it in front of a Viper jet engine. And uh, that will demonstrate that we've got the manufacturing uh, techniques, the frost control techniques that I haven't discussed, and uh, that it's viable to run such a heat exchanger in front of a, a high power axial flow compressor. Okay. Uh, Richard, thank you very much. Thank you. And the Sabre engine eventually became a real possibility. But as development progressed, the costs increased and the technical challenges became more apparent, leading politicians to have concerns about the feasibility of the project. Additionally, there were concerns about the project's commercial viability and the global space industry's competitiveness. In 1989, the British government canceled the Hotel program. But despite its cancellation, the Hotel project left a significant legacy in the aerospace industry. The magnificent, almost completed Sabre engine. The incredible engineers from Rolls-Royce and other companies could not stand to see it die. And some of them formed a private company called Reaction Engines Limited and sought private funding to continue their work. Over the following years, REL continued to refine and advance the Sabre engine technology, addressing technical challenges and fine-tuning its design. Reaction Engines Limited started to explore collaboration with various international partners including the European Space Agency, to support the development of the Sabre engine and related spaceplane concepts. And from that came this beautiful spaceplane. This is the single stage to orbit spaceplane called Skylon. Skylon was designed to provide reusable and cost-effective access to space, with a payload capacity to LEO of approximately 15 metric tons making it suitable for launching satellites, resupplying space stations, and other space missions. 
The Sabre engines were by now fully developed and ready to start flight testing. But while the Skylon had garnered significant attention and interest, it did not get sufficient funding to build the airframe. But reaction engines kept going. In 2014, they formed a cooperative research and development agreement with the U.S. Air Force Research Laboratory. In March of 2017, Reaction formed an American subsidiary headquarters in Colorado called Reaction Engines Incorporated. By September of 2017, they had proven their engine at air intake temperatures exceeding 1,270 kelvins with a successful supersonic ground test of their precooler technology at a simulated Mach 5. The precooler is the secret to the Sabre engine's genius. As the air enters a jet engine at supersonic or hypersonic speeds, it becomes hotter than the engine can withstand due to compression effects. Most jet engines solve this problem by using heavy copper or nickel-based materials, reducing the engine's pressure ratio, and by throttling back the engine at the higher air speeds to avoid melting. This won't work for a single stage to orbit or SSTO space plane, because such heavy materials create too high of a mass burden, and maximum speed is necessary for orbital insertion at the earliest time to minimize gravity losses. Sabre solves this problem by using a gaseous helium coolant loop. This helium loop in the counterflow heat exchanger allows the spent helium to exit the engine at a sufficiently high temperature to drive pumps and compressors for the liquid hydrogen fuel and helium working fluid itself, while dramatically cooling the air from 1,000 Celsius down to minus 150 Celsius. This exchanger is built to liquefy the air without the buildup of water ice that would block the cooler spaces between the 16,800 thin-walled tubes. How the cooler prevented ice buildup had been a closely guarded secret, but in 2015, REL disclosed a methanol-injecting 3D-printed de-icer when it filed for patents on the system, as they needed partner companies and had to protect their intellectual property. The Sabre engine beautifully combines elements of jet and rocket propulsion, so it can operate as a jet engine in the lower atmosphere, increasing efficiency, and obviating the need for a multi-stage system. Remember that chemical rocket engines are limited to about 465 seconds of specific impulse, and that's only when they use cryogenic liquid hydrogen fuel. But jet engines routinely get up to 6,000 seconds of specific impulse, even without hydrogen, because they are using atmospheric oxygen. As the vehicle ascends into the vacuum of space, it then transitions to traditional rocket mode, using onboard liquid oxygen to fly itself to orbit. Despite the cancellation of Hotal and Skylon, other companies are now developing hypersonic passenger aircraft point-to-point -point suborbital cargo delivery, and some still dream of horizontal launch and landing single-stage to orbit space planes. The Sabre engine may someday help make this dream a reality. A critical member of the Sabre team that built this magnificent engine is Mr. Alan Bond, and now I'll let him explain the development of the Sabre engine. The university's advanced space concepts laboratory and is on a topic that I'm pretty sure James Weir would be leaning forward in his seat to hear about. Alan Bond's company, Reaction Engines Limited, are designers and developers of advanced space transportation and propulsion, according to their website. Alan was born at Ripley in Derbyshire, as was Barnes Wallace. He worked at Rolls-Royce on the British Blue Streak rocket project and then at BAC on other rocket work. From 1976 to 1990, he was with the UK Atomic Energy Authority, working on various nuclear fusion and advanced space propulsion systems. He originated the Hotol space plane engine design in 1982. I'm sure he'll be touching on that later in his lecture. Alan formed Reaction Engines Limited in 1989, joining it full-time in 1990, and is its current managing director. So Alan has a uniquely broad and long-term perspective on advanced concepts for space and near-space transport. I'm de delighted to welcome Alan Bond to the University of Strathclyde and call on him to give the first James Weir lecture. <clears throat> Thank you very much for that uh, glowing introduction, Jason.
and uh, I have to say I, I hadn't realised that this was, this was going to be the honour of the inaugural James Weir Lecture, so I've got an awful uh, lot to live up to here. The talk that I gave up until a couple of years ago was very speculative about what we could do, what uh, advanced propulsion techniques offered for a distant future, which was sort of vaguely linked to uh, some plan in my mind and people at the British Interplanetary Society and so on. However, <clears throat> I'm pleased to say that over the uh, past two years particularly, but numerous events perhaps spanning back four years, have led to a situation which at this very moment, everything that I'm going to tell you tonight is actually happening. It's, it's not something which is a vague concept which may or may not come about. It may still not happen. We in Britain are extremely good at snatching the iron from the fire at the last minute. But uh, as things stand tonight, uh, the British government uh, has put an awful lot of effort into bringing space to the fore, and that effort includes the work at reaction engines. And for the first time in many years, the British government is actually considering that we will look at the enabling technologies of getting payloads into space and not just being a nation that exploits other people's capabilities of getting things into space just so that we can do the space science or the communications and so on. We're actually interested in uh, providing the actual technology to do the job. Now, my own background was uh, very much Blue Street back in the uh, uh, 1960s and early 70s, Black Arrow. Black Arrow is a classic example of uh, British ingen ingenuity. Um, it was pretty much standard rocket technology, but nonetheless extremely well engineered, which is what we've tended to do in the UK over the years. And so this vehicle had an extremely good mass ratio, rather a funny looking shape, very heavily optimized to uh, get the best out of a vehicle of this size. Black Arrow wasn't much heavier than V2 at takeoff. And yet, one of the satellites that it, the only satellite that it managed to launch, is still up there. And uh, a reminder to everybody that we in Britain, having shown that we can do something, sort of get bored rather quickly and move away from it. Blue Street, we developed a uh, respectable weapon system. There are people uh, who are advocates that we were sort of robbed when we lost Blue Streak. I'm not one of those advocates. If uh, you go to East Fortune, just down the road here, um, go on a day when they'll let you into the little hangar at the back where they've got, uh, I think it's the F-16 round of Blue Streak. And alongside Blue Streak is a Polaris A3 missile. And you will see there is no comparison as a weapon system. And so what we did, we offered this to the Europeans. We built a multi-stage rocket out of it. And then, of course, we pulled out the first stage, which left the Europeans sort of a, a little bit lost for what to do next. Just uh, a few, well, 100 miles down the road at uh, British Aircraft Corporation uh, in the 1960s, people there were already looking at trying to get reusability into uh, launches. And a very successful study this was, but sadly, again, uh, it uh, never saw the light of day. And then in the mid-1980s, uh, we started on the HOTL project, and uh, that came from the fact that uh, in the uh, early 1980s, I'd managed to adapt some thermodynamic principles from nuclear engines that I'd been working on and found that they could be applied to air breathing engines, and I'll talk about that in more detail uh, later in my talk. <coughs> Excuse me. But the main thing is this study got underway. It had its problems, and I'll mention what those were, um, but the biggest problem of all was uh, this guy, and if the Conservatives win the election, I'm afraid he, like Dracula, may be back to haunt us. So, <clears throat> launches then today, uh, things have moved on a bit from those days of Black Arrow and Blue Streak. In Europe, after we pulled out our first stage, the Europeans went on and developed uh, uh, rather outstanding technology, ultimately. Uh, Ariane 4, which came before it, was a bit basic, but Ariane 5 is a very sophisticated uh, modern launch vehicle. Uh, the good old uh, faithful Soyuz launcher, of course, is still with us, uh, derived from a ballistic missile. Uh, now must be by far the longest serving launcher uh, that we have. And of course the space shuttle, which 
uh, was an attempt to uh, build and derive a reusable vehicle. Prior to this, sh this vehicle coming into existence, uh, the Space Shuttle was going to be a two-stage flyback uh, piggyback aeroplane configuration and that went to Congress and Congress threw it out and said come back at half the development cost. Well, they did come back at half the development cost. The orbiter survived, which is really a reusable space station that you send into orbit. Uh, it happens to have some rocket engines strapped on it. But this big drop tank gets thrown away and the solid boosters are recovered, but that's really a political recovery more than a, uh, an economic recovery. The economics of operating those boosters, towing them back from the ocean, stripping them completely bare and rebuilding them, uh, really uh, is, is a questionable economic activity. So big problem with all of this, it's extremely expensive. Uh, you've got to develop the vehicles, which cost you many billions of dollars to do. Um, you then have to produce them on a regular basis and of course you never see all the components again with the exception in this case of the space shuttle and that is now nearing the end of its life. The question that has vexed me uh, right from my first uh, uh, brush with rockets is do we really need to throw these rockets away and do we really need to go multi-stage? Could we have something which is single stage like an aeroplane which can go into space, do its job, come back, and then a few days later do it again. I think air travel would have been uh, uh, pretty slow off the ground if every time we did a, a flight to America, you threw the airplane into the ocean uh, at the end of the mission. So, oops. One of the problems we've got, uh, a dear colleague of mine, Bob Parkinson, points out that the Earth is 10% too big. Uh, had we been able to live on Venus, then getting into orbit would be much easier and rocket engines that we know and love would enable us to do it. So it's a little bit of a, a cosmic joke that the Earth's just a little bit too big. However, consider if we'd lived on a planet twice the size. If there are people out in the universe and living on planets twice the size of the Earth, maybe they're not here because they can't get, to, get off the damn place that they were born in. So with near-term materials and technology and discounting the use of ozone and fluorine, <clears throat> it becomes obvious that we've got to make use of the atmosphere. There is, without going nuclear, and that's the subject of a different lecture, we must use the atmosphere both as a reaction mass and also for its chemical energy. I'm uh, told that I can sort of get a little bit more technical with the people in this audience than I'm uh, usually used to, so I assume that everyone here is familiar with the sort of... Uh, rocket equation normally uh, attributed to Tsiolkovsky but was actually being set as standard exams at Cambridge uh, for university graduates during the mid-19th mid, uh, uh, century. But the object here is if we want to get into orbit, we've got to build a system that we can put about 9.5 kilometers per second delta V into the vehicle. And so here we are. If we're going to do that, then the vehicle has to have give or take a mass ratio of about eight. That is, at liftoff, it weighs eight times as much as it weighs when it's burnt all of its propellant getting to orbit. And that's quite a tall order. Now, one option is to go air breathing all the way. You, you uh, build a, a scramjet or something like that, and you put a lot of uh, effort into the air breathing side of it. But we can consider this a little bit more logically. Suppose that we take the rocket, which, which can very nearly do this job, and what we do is give it a bit of help. We just put sufficient air-breathing propulsion on it uh, to reduce the job that the rocket engines have to do. And along here is the Mach number at transition from air-breathing to rocket. And just have a look at what it does to the mass ratio. So suppose that we could fly it up to Mach 1 before we turn the rocket engines on then we get the mass ratio down to about 7.5. If we get to Mach 3 before we turn the engines on, it's about 6.5. If we went up to Mach 7, then we can get away with a mass ratio of about 5. Now, of course, we're putting all of the air breathing kit and wings and all of those things on there, so they have got to pay for having that on board. And the Americans have put quite a lot of effort into looking at going up to Mach 10 to try to get the effort that you've got to put into the rocket really down. But again, if we return to a little bit of logic for a moment, 
what we see is that uh, air breathing is difficult. This is a sort of fairly standard perfect gas relation relating the stagnation temperature to Mach number. I've simply put 220K in as a sort of typical temperature at uh, altitude. And you can see the stagnation temperature is climbing astronomically as you start to put more and more in with the air breathing. And really, by the time you're above Mach 5, if we just pop back to Sarkowski, we can see that we're getting most of the benefit. But we're managing to avoid most of the stagnation temperature implications. And so if we could find an engine that would get us up to Mach 5 air breathing, uh, without introducing too much of a weight penalty, then uh, we should be starting to win out. At uh, the National Gas Turbine Establishment, now uh, uh, long subsumed into other establishments, I'm afraid, uh, Jefferson Beaton in 1962 came up with the concept of the liquid air cycle engine in which air passes into an intake and a heat exchanger, the liquid hydrogen uh, fuel is simply pumped through this in sufficient quantities to liquefy the air and then uh, in this rather simple little diagram pumping the liquid air into a rocket combustion chamber for the early part of the air breathing ascent. And the advantage of that of course is that when you finish with the air breathing bit at some uh, unspecified Mach number you can then go on to replace the liquid air with liquid oxygen that you're carrying on the vehicle. So this concept goes back a very long way. There are huge problems in simply what's put there, but here you can see that uh, the liquefaction is a simple-minded process of simply putting cold liquid in, uh, cold air comes out, and hot gaseous hydrogen uh, is the, uh, the product. Well, it turns out that uh, if you sort of get to grips with the thermodynamics and uh, invoke uh, entropy as well as conservation of energy, then there are some interesting tricks that you can play. And uh, for those of you uh, who are familiar with entropy, you'll know that there's a perfect gas relationship for the change of entropy of a fluid, which relates not only the temperature ratio, but the pressure ratio that the fluid goes through. And therefore, if you set the, the delta entropy to zero, you can trade a temperature ratio for a pressure ratio. And so if instead of using the hydrogen simply as a coolant, you use it as the heat rejection system for a thermodynamic cycle. Lots of things are possible. And so having given you that tempter, temp, uh, this tempter, I shall uh, come back to that in a little while. As uh, Jason referred to, um, the immediate product of the work that uh, I did on this in the, the 1980s was the HOTOR vehicle. And you can see that we had what was essentially a rocket, and we put up some wings on it, and you can see that being rocket engineers, we put all the engines on the back of the vehicle, and we had the liquid hydrogen tank in this long forebody. That was a fundamental mistake. Nonetheless, it was an inspired study, and this still remains the only study in the open literature where you can actually go and find everything that was done. Uh, British Aerospace and Rolls-Royce really gave this a very, very thorough going over, and at the end of it, the conclusion was that we'd got some serious problems, but nonetheless the concept was fundamentally sound. And the serious problem was but that by putting the engines on the rear of the fuselage, we had determined absolutely where the centre of gravity was going to be. And the problem with this configuration is that as you accelerate up the Mach number range, the lift on the forebody remains more or less constant, uh, but of course the lift on the wings falls off as uh, 1 over the root of m squared minus 1. So you have a tremendous move forward of the uh, effective center of pressure of the configuration. And at Mach 5, we were trying to battle with a 2,000 ton meter moment, trying to pitch the nose of the vehicle up. And that result required huge flaperons. It required an equally huge power supply to drive it. And this vehicle became a transport system for hydraulics into low Earth orbit. So. After a lot of uh, thinking, uh, we, we, uh, reaction engines sort of came into being at the end of uh, the 1980s, and we tried to understand what had gone wrong, and the answer was don't put the engines on the back of the fuselage. And because it turned into a rather long pointy sort of shape, uh, I'm sorry to say that I remember the uh, Skylon sculpture at the uh, Festival of Britain in 1951. 
and uh, so we named it Skylum after this very inspirational uh, British exhibition. <clears throat> Unfortunately, Jason told me tonight that uh, he gained his inspiration from a project I worked on when he was 11, so uh, we won't dwell on that further in, uh, in this talk. What do we want out of a, uh, a space plane if it's going to have commercial uh, characteristics? We want it to be reusable. Single stage, we don't want to be sort of uh, getting an airfix kit at the launch site every time we do a mission and have to put it all together. We'd like it to be unpiloted. Uh, a lot of people sort of don't really like that, but a pilot hurts you in several ways. First of all, you have to keep him alive, so uh, we've got to put a life support system on, which is a waste of payload. It means that in the development program that uh, you are constrained again by having to keep the pilot alive. So uh, most of the systems that you put onto the program have got to be developed like a civil air airliner or at least a military aircraft. Uh, rather than a missile program. And uh, finally, of course, um, the uh, uh, pilot needs training and the whole thing results in a huge uh, complex of simulations and so on. And throwing the pilot off halves the cost of the project. Now, I often find that there are people who dispute that, but they come from time after World War II when during the uh, sort of five years after World War II, we managed to kill 37 test pilots. Well, people take a dim view of that these days. And so uh, nowadays, uh, unpiloted uh, is the deemed best. One of the advantages of aircraft is you can abort the mission. A lot of aircraft take off and have to go back because something has gone wrong. Um, it's got the capability both in terms of redundancy, uh, but also in terms of its design to actually not carry out the mission, but not lose the payload. We need user-friendly operations. You've all seen what goes on at the Cape and various things like that, where a huge kit of parts comes together. You've got to assemble it, put it together, uh, get it out to the site, check it out, and soon, in, in about 2% of cases, we get that wrong, and it goes into the nearest ocean instead of into low Earth orbit. Now, a very important point is re-entry cross-range. Douglas Aircraft Company in the 1960s actually convincingly showed we could do single stage to orbit with a rocket-like vehicle with a very large uh, Apollo capsule-like base which you discharge the engine exhaust into and you'd re-enter it base first. That concept I worked on for many years. I'm quite convinced it would work. However, the cross range is limited to about 200 kilometers. That means that uh, either side of the ground track you can only pull about 200 kilometers in either direction. And this means in a commercial operation, uh, you've got a guy on the ground waiting to fly a customer's payload and your vehicle is still in orbit, waiting to cross the landing site for you to get it back. And so it's quite important to have a high lift ratio during re-entry of the order of three, whereas other concepts of the order of a half for the sort of ballistic rocket. And this will give you a cross range of over 3,000 kilometers, which means that you only need to come to the pass before or after uh, the one that would cross the landing site, and you can still pull sufficient cross range to land the vehicle. And of course, these days we all like to uh, make claims about environmental impact, and I won't dwell on that. The configuration that we came up with then is engines on the wing tips. That gets rid of the CG problem, because you can move the wing wherever you want, and the CG goes with it. And you put the payload over the CG so that when you've got a payload on board, it minimizes the uh, uh, movement of the center of gravity. During, uh, you've got liquid hydrogen and you've got liquid oxygen. And during the air breathing ascent, you burn the hydrogen from the rear tank because this still suffers from the same problem that HOTL had, but now it's much smaller. There's only about a 200 ton meter moment. But by burning the hydrogen out of the rear tank, the center of gravity tracks forward as well. And therefore, you can nicely cancel out. There is a residual uh, problem, but you can trim that out with the canard four planes. I don't want to dwell too long on this because I want to talk about the engines predominantly. With a liquid hydrogen vehicle, um, the good old faithful stress skin structures that uh, have stood us in good stead since the 1920s on aircraft design uh, are no longer applicable. 
a lot of people have looked at hydrogen-fueled aircraft and come to the conclusion that they don't really work. And that's because they're stuck with the idea of the stress skin structure. Brilliant innovation, though it was. But there was an earlier technology, which was airships. And liquid hydrogen really is the same problem that you have with airships. It's a very low uh, aerial loading of the vehicle. And it turns out that uh, you really need to build yourself a Warren Gerda structure uh, for the aircraft, uh, put an aeroshell over the outside of it, uh, made out of uh, a fibre-reinforced glass material, uh, which uh, if we have a look at a temperature-specific strength chart, we've got um, silicon carbide reinforced titanium and uh, we've got at the high temperature end carbon carbon <coughs> and uh, silicon carbide silicon carbide and there is this material which is a fiber reinforced glass the original material was silicon carbide fibers in pyrex immediately a success because the pyrex sticks to the silicon carbide and gives a very good material um, there are now other glass ceramic matrix uh, uh, materials and in this region here is a very nice material which we developed in this country uh, which has got good temperature characteristics and good uh, specific strength characteristics. We're currently working with a French firm called Pyromeral and we are actually testing uh, some of their material for monatomic uh, chemistry compatibility in a, uh, a glow discharge uh, uh, system that we built at Reaction Engines. And so um, a airship light structure with a glass ceramic aeroshell. One of the advantages of having the hydrogen tanks on board is that Skyland re-enters about 10 kilometers higher than the space shuttle. And as a result, it doesn't reach such high temperatures. It has a larger heat soak, and that's one of the problems of uh, things with low ballistic coefficients taking a long time to re-enter. Uh, but uh, by carrying 200 kilograms of liquid hydrogen for the return journey, and vaporizing it in all that tankage which you can see is underneath the aeroshell, then we can cope with the heat load uh, problem. There seems to be absolutely no other application for this material. If there is a god, he intended these materials for the aeroshells of re-entering space planes and no other application whatever. <clears throat> Skyline is quite a mature project. Kinetic uh, some years ago did tests at uh, Mach 9 and uh, Mach 12 in the gun tunnel and in the flow visualization tunnel at Farnborough and uh, you can sort of see the sort of flow structure. The gun tunnel tests did show up uh, some uh, uh, shock shock interaction heatings and shock boundary layer interaction heating problems. We anticipated the shock shock ones but we'd miss the shock boundary layer uh, problem but again I don't want to dwell on that. So Skylon, configuration C1, which is uh, the one that I've mainly been talking about, 12 tons to low Earth orbit, 10 tons to the International Space Station, a 200 cubic meter payload bay, 4.6 meter uh, diameter payload, and about 275 tons at the start of roll at takeoff. So a quite reasonable sort of machine. It is 82 meters long, and uh, so the fuselage is about the size of a 777 fuselage and that's because of the liquid hydrogen even though we've only got about uh, 70 tons of liquid hydrogen on board uh, with something which has got only seven percent of the density of water uh, it's obviously a real disadvantage we are currently revising this to the d1 standard with a 15 ton payload because this design is now uh, rather ancient so a picture's worth a thousand words and a video's worth a thousand pictures. So just a very quick uh, uh, run through this. Gives you some idea of the sort of structural elements of the vehicle. Payload <coughs> bay, liquid oxygen tanks, the hydrogen tanks, the glass ceramic aeroshell, and the engines in the cells on the wingtips and an undercarriage. Skylong, um, Hotel, sorry, could never take off on its own undercarriage, um, but Skylong is able to do that. And in order to accept the energy of a rejected takeoff, we are proposing to use water-cooled brakes, and on a successful takeoff, you throw away the one and a half tons of water that it takes to cool the brakes if you need to reject it. Otherwise, Skylong would be a transportation system for brakes into low Earth orbit. <coughs> 
The idea is to uh, try to make the loading of the payload extremely simple. Uh, I don't know what the current cost is, but uh, 15 years or so ago, it used to cost $5 million just to put the payload into the shuttle payload bay. We're trying to look at the uh, concepts of containerized payloads <clears throat> so that your spacecraft arrives factory fresh uh, to go with the Skylon into orbit. In terms of fueling it, the tractor tows the vehicle out onto the start of the apron and then uh, liquid hydrogen, liquid oxygen, uh, liquid helium, which is needed for pressurization and, as you will see in a moment, uh, uh, engine operation transferred into the vehicle. And then the tractor, the tractor uh, pulls the vehicle to the start of the runway. One of the serious problems with the design of undercarriages is all the taxiing that aircraft do around airports. Um, it twists the undercarriage out of the supports in the wing and so we do the minimum amount of movement on the undercarriage possible. The engine, as we'll come to, is air breathing right from square one. Unlike a ramjet or a scramjet, this engine is operational right from uh, a standing start and under air breathing conditions will drive the vehicle into uh, to an altitude of about uh, 26 kilometers and Mach 5. Obviously, you've got to close the intakes when you do the transition to rocket because eventually you're going to re-enter into the atmosphere and you don't want the uh, high enthalpy flow into the intakes during re-entry. These engines also have a bypass system, which uh, I'll just briefly mention later. <clears throat> we have to close the bypass system off as well. On orbit, there's a orbital maneuvering system. You can see the OMS engines sort of uh, putting in the final velocity there, and 38 reaction control thrusters uh, for attitude control and so on on orbit. And there's an auxiliary propellant supply in the vehicle mounted in the tail that provides a sort of uh, uh, gas main around the vehicle to provide gaseous hydrogen, gaseous oxygen for fuel cells, um, auxiliary power supplies, and also the thrusters. The vehicle can carry a range of payloads, including a uh, uh, manned passenger module, which is depicted in this uh, slide. And as I'll mention at the end of the talk, uh, we think that uh, this is the first part of an entire space infrastructure. And if you're going to build equipment in orbit, you need an on-orbit assembly facility, which is what's depicted here. <coughs> During re-entry, the vehicle enters the atmosphere at a very high uh, uh, angle of attack initially, about 70 degrees, in order to lose as much velocity as possible in the first instance. Uh, but then during the re-entry, it undergoes a gradual uh, pitch down to about 11 degrees, which gives us its uh, maximum lift-to-drag ratio at round about uh, Mach 11. Um, at round about Mach 9, we get authority from the tail fin. Uh, prior to that, we have to use, same as the space shuttle does, the uh, lateral yaw thrusters in order to control yaw. But we can control the pitch during the entry on the four planes. Uh, we have to carry uh, water as a coolant for the four planes for that uh, part of it. And then finally, the vehicle comes in for a uh, dead stick landing, just like the shuttle. Okay, so that's, that's the vehicle essentially, and uh, now I want to, to come on to uh, uh, the engines. The 
engines are at first sight quite complicated and so I've produced various diagrams at uh, different phases of trying to present this and I'll try this one on you and see whether you like this. I mentioned that what we actually want to do to try to reduce the amount of hydrogen required to cool the air is be a bit cleverer than just pump it through the airflow to cool it. So we'd like to use the hydrogen as a heat sink for a thermodynamic cycle. So here's the hot air, the heat exchanger, which transfers heat through the cycle, which we can then drive the turbine with. So rather cunningly, some of the heat never actually leaves the air. It actually gets immediately put back into it through the compression process. And therefore, we don't have to remove all of the heat from the air with the hydrogen. The only part that gets removed is by the uh, heat sink function, which eventually finishes back in the combustion chamber anyway. So this is the first sort of chapter, or well, second chapter normally, of your thermodynamic textbook on heat engines. And that uh, what we're doing is uh, actually getting some work out of the heat transfer process. It gets a bit more complicated when you try to uh, start putting some of the equipment in, so uh, this is sort of a semi-real uh, schematic. Here's the pre-cooler, and what we've done is introduce a helium loop actually into the engine. Uh, we, on HOTEL, we did all this with a hydrogen loop, but everybody was very worried about what happens if a pigeon goes in and breaks the pre-cooler, and all the hydrogen then goes through the engine. Um, that's something that could be debated, but anyway, we chose to use helium. The main reason being that the inconol materials that we'd like to use in the pre-cooler don't like hydrogen. Uh, with helium, uh, you can use some of the better uh, nickel alloys, and we, in fact, use inconol 718. So a helium circulator takes cold helium, cools this, and then passes it through another heat exchanger, which is heated by a pre-burner, <coughs> so that helium is always at 1180 Kelvin at this point here. That then goes to drive the turbine, which is driving the compressor, before rejecting heat to the liquid hydrogen flow, and the whole of the hydrogen flow goes to the pre-burner. The airflow bifurcates. Part of it goes to the pre-burner, a variable amount to the pre-burner, depending on what Mach number you're at, and the rest of it meets up with the rest of the hydrogen in the uh, combustion chamber. Now, the advantage of this is that you can vary the temperature of the pre-burner so that this temperature here in the helium loop is always constant at 1180K. So, with the exception of this bit of the engine, the rest of this engine doesn't know what Mach number it's flying at. It's a drag racer engine. It's not a Formula One cruise engine. And what we need, if we're going to... Uh, uh, have a successful uh, air breathing accelerator is, a, is an engine which is Mach number insensitive. And until we reach the temperature limits in the pre-cooler, that's exactly what this engine is. Once you start to put it together in reality, it starts to get a bit more complicated. You can see that the pre-cooler is quite a dominant part of the engine, the turbo compressor, the rocket engines, and then all the thermodynamic gadgetry is in here. <coughs> It's an annoyance that uh, the captured airflow in a, high, in a supersonic intake does not match the airflow of the engine, and the captured flow goes roughly as one over the Mach number. So at low Mach numbers, very much more air is entering the intake than you need, so you bypass that air around the engine. Even with these clever thermodynamic tricks, the engine still takes far more hydrogen than you need for combustion in the main chambers. So that extra hydrogen is added to the burners in the bypass duct. And at this point, there's usually somebody who says, so what this really is is a turbo ramjet. But it's not, because in a turbo ramjet, you use the gas turbine to accelerate you up to some Mach number. You then turn the ramjets on, and it's the ramjets that continue to the higher Mach numbers. And this is the, exactly the opposite. At Mach 5, there is virtually no flow down this at all, and all of the thrust is developed by the main engines. The maximum thrust from the bypass duct in this case comes at round about Mach 3 to 3.5, where it gives a very useful contribution. So uh, some parameters then. Uh, the nozzle area ratio is of the order of 100, a bit more than that in current designs. Uh, in the air breathing mode, the combustion pressure is about 102 bar. If you think about a gas turbine, uh, 
then that is sort of around about 30 bar. Um, so that's a, a very sporty compressor, uh, but, but nonetheless, uh, 140 bar delivery compressor is, uh, is quite doable. Um, the rocket combustion pressure is sort of state of the art, 145 bar. Um, what other things are of equivalence ratio during air breathing? The equivalence ratio of the engine, that is the um, number of times the hydrogen that we need above uh, stoichiometric is about 2.8, whereas the old LACE engine was around about 4. So we've made a substantial improvement in that. And as a consequence, we get a theoretical effective exhaust velocity of about 16 kilometers per second compared with a theoretical of about 46, 000, uh, 46 kilometers per second. And we are currently looking at new designs of Sabre engines, Sabre 4 as it's known, which uh, approaches that sort of number. But I shan't be saying anything about that tonight. Pre-cooler construction then. We've well, shown that with a pre-cooler we can actually do this job and do it rather well. <coughs> but how do we make it? Well, the designs that we currently work on uh, involve huge numbers of extremely small tubes. Um, the tubes that we're dealing with are less than a millimetre in diameter, uh, made out of Inconol uh, 718. And they are modular in that we have a header, um, a sort of Swiss roll of tube sheet to an inside header. The air flows radially in through the heat exchanger and the cold helium flows in through the header out along this spiral track to the outside and then out here. So this heat exchanger has got the air in cross flow but the overall effect of the heat exchanger is pure counterflow almost. And these heat exchangers have got extremely high effectiveness, um, 92, 95% effectiveness. And here's some that we did earlier. This was one of our first ones. What I want to emphasize here, you're looking at a tube here, it's 0.8 of a milli 0.88 millimeter bore with a 30 micron wall. And uh, our current tubes are of that sort of order. This is an earlier research heat exchanger that we built, and a lot of our effort goes into, after all of this clever stuff, into the nitty-gritty of how do you braze these tubes into the headers. And that is quite a major task. <clears throat> when the air enters the engine, it's about 1,000 degrees centigrade. By the time it's been through the pre cool it's about minus 140. And, of course, there's a lot of water vapour, even in the air in this room at the moment. And if you just try to do that trick, what happens within about three to five seconds, the whole thing is frozen absolutely solid. So a lot of our activity uh, in this research tunnel was to find a way of preventing frost formation. And what you can see here is this is the pressure drop through the matrix over a period of about 11 minutes, I think, in that particular test. And you can see that we solved that problem. Um, but the bad news is I'm not going to tell you how we did it. So uh, you can see here the temperature on the air side is down at sort of minus 80. And during the course of the test, the coolant side temperature um, follows a program uh, uh, so that we can get as much information as possible, starting at sort of minus 50 uh, down to about minus 150. So we did solve the, cool the frost formation problem. And there's an example of a module. And these are modules that were built under a European Space Agency contract. This is for a different engine, a different project I'm not going to dwell on tonight, which is for a civil airliner application, a Mach 5 airliner um, to do Brussels to uh, uh, Sydney in four hours and 40 minutes. And uh, so if anybody wants to know more about that, then I'm happy to answer questions later. But the important thing for the moment is the pre-cooler technology, and you can see that we're doing pretty good at braised joints these days. And we're very, very close now to getting 100% uh, braised joint success. If we don't get 100%, we simply plug uh, the few percent of tubes that, uh, that leak. Now, <clears throat> Heat transfer in these engines is extremely important. <coughs> Excuse me. And it turns out that the whole thing is dominated by the heat transfer coefficient on the air side of the pre-cooler. If we could improve that, then uh, quite uh, major miracles are possible with this type of engine. <coughs> we currently have uh, a student from University of Bristol, 
doing her PhD working on heat transfer enhancement uh, on uh, the tubes in a matrix like this. This is a flow visualization. Um, we operate these heat exchanges pretty much in the laminar regime, la uh, laminar to transitional. And uh, so what uh, she is looking at is whether we can modify the surface of the tube without putting up the weight too much or the pressure drop. Now, to give you an idea of the, the problem, the wall thickness of the tubes when we finish with them is about 15 microns. They're much thicker than that when we get them from the manufacturer. Uh, but we then process them down to about 15 microns for uh, a real engine. We've moved on now. Um, we've solved virtually all of the problems. And one of the uh, things that I want to say is that we are no longer into research on these engines. Uh, we are into development, but there are no issues left in this project uh, where we need to, for example, go and talk to DARPA, which is a, a sort of frequent suggestion. Um, we, uh, we don't have any research issues left, but what we are in the process of doing is using a Viper jet engine uh, with a pre-cooler mounted in front of it, um, using liquid nitrogen as the heat rejection system and uh, a 200 bar helium loop in order to demonstrate that uh, um, we can actually build these pre-coolers and operate them. Uh, we've had this facility ready at Cullum now for quite a few years and thanks to uh, ESA grants and private uh, uh, finance totaling about £6 million, uh, we're now in the process of getting to the point where we're going to be testing this in anger uh, during the middle of next year. We're currently uh, uh, building these pre-cooler pre modules. We've set up our own production plant in Abingdon and we've also acquired two other uh, manufacturing companies which are part of Reaction Engines uh, to build all of this equipment. So Reaction Engines has moved on from three people in their lounge uh, uh, with some faxes um, now to quite a sizable company with a lot of facilities to do this. <coughs> we would also like to try to get some clever nozzles because I mentioned that the area ratio was 100 to 1 and under those circumstances the nozzle is very heavily separated. For a long time there has been in the literature the expansion deflection nozzle. Now I don't know if you can see just inside here uh, there's a sort of uh, pintle which means that the flow in this nozzle comes out as, a rate, as an annular uh, sheet uh, filling the nozzle completely and you can just see uh, the uh, uh, film there in this engine which we built and uh, tested a couple of years ago now. Um, it's very short, of course, it's adiabatically cool. Um, but uh, let's see if I can go back and do that again in case. Uh, and in particular, you'll see that all the action is in this sort of few millimetre thick layer here at the edge. Uh, we, we injected salt water into that to make it visible. Normally, you can't actually see that in operation. The other aspect of these engines are the turbines, and this is... Uh, an experimental turbine, which is a counter-rotating turbine with no stators in it. Now, I, I glibly showed you a cold air compressor driven by a helium turbine. Now, helium, low molecular weight, high temperature, the turbine wants to run fast. Um, the air is cold, miserable, low molecular weight, and therefore wants to run slow. And the way to do this is to split the compressor into two spools, to throw the stators out of the turbine and have the turbine stages contra-rotating, each stage rotating relative to the opposite direction of the one after it. This way you can fool the turbine into thinking it's running twice as fast as it really is. And as a consequence of that, the turbine efficiencies can be very good. 94% uh, uh, we achieved uh, in, in this experimental turbine. The blading for this was designed by the uh, von Karman Institute in uh, uh, Belgium. And there you can see uh, rotors 1 and 2 and rotors 2 and 4 with the inlet plenum. There are other heat exchangers and we've got ongoing research uh, on that. Uh, to give you an idea, this is a, 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 a CAD drawing, but we're looking at channels which literally you can't see. It's a bit like looking at a CD when you look at one of these things. Uh, we're looking at f these channels are sort of 50 microns with about uh, 6 micron wall actually separating them and uh, those are a uh, 
vexing manufacturing problem which I won't dwell on uh, any longer. But we've also investigated silicon carbide manufacturing at Tenmap, and uh, in this case, this is reaction bonded silicon carbide, um, which they uh, uh, flood with, uh, make basically start with graphite, flood with liquid silicon, which uh, converts it to silicon carbide. And one of the problems we get is these little silicon spherules uh, which fill the channels, and we have to get those out. But uh, it looks as though this technology can be developed quite successfully. They, they really did quite a, a rather simple uh, bit of development work for us, and it looks as though that is with us. At the present time, we're looking at heat exchangers, which are with very good uh, entropy-conserving characteristics, delivering about 300 megawatts per ton of heat exchanger. And that is more than adequate to get successful engines. And we are nowhere near the physical limits uh, at that. But uh, what we are pushing at the moment is the manufacturing limits. The whole future of this is uh, manufacturing the components. Skylon then, just to sort of reiterate, it's about a nine and a half year program. It's going to cost about seven billion pounds. Each vehicle off is going to cost about 190 million if we produce 30 vehicles. And we think we can build a vehicle that will survive about 200 flights before it goes to the crusher. Uh, that means an engine lifetime in each vehicle of about 50 hours. And that helps a lot. Uh, we're well out of creep issues and so on. Um, the recurring cost for a flight, therefore, comes down to about £5 million uh, pounds a flight, so let's say $8 million. Um, currently on the Space Shuttle, a uh, flight is about $700 million. Now, what I haven't put in that figure is the insurance. The insurance is a vexed issue. Third-party insurance could quite easily come to $10 million a flight, and the first-party insurance would be of the order of $5 million. So three-quarters of the flight costs with a vehicle like this in the early stages of entry to service would be insurance costs. Uh, so... Um, the, launch, the thing that I want to point out is the launch pi price pays everything in this case. There's no subsidies, as there are with the Ariane vehicle and so on. Spaceports are commercial. And what we hope is that there will eventually be something like a dozen or so commercial operators competing with the payloads to go. And the objective is to move the whole of access to space into uh, uh, the commercial arena. So having said that, I just want to spend about... Uh, 10 minutes just briefly going through what the consequences of that will be. It's not new. Uh, people have been looking for the last 60 or more years at um, having a space infrastructure. Now, I really wish that we, sh we could just dump all the bits in orbit like that and they'd stay there as the early pioneers sort of envisaged. The reality is that each of these components is in its own orbit around the Earth, and therefore all this lot jostles around every, t every time it orbits the Earth. So you have to have a facility to actually uh, do it in. Some of the equipment that we need for Skylon is an upper stage, because one, one mode of operation is to not go quite to orbit, but boot the payload out with its own propulsion stage and let it go to orbit and land the, land the aircraft downrange, and then by one means or other get the aeroplane back. Um, it is possible on orbital missions to go into resonant orbits now. It's just a coincidence that at 300 kilometers, um, Skylon is resonant with the geostationary transfer orbit. So when Skylon does seven orbits of the Earth, the upper stage does an orbit out to geostationary, trans uh, uh, geostationary orbit altitude and back again. And it meets up with the Skylon with a little bit of orbital maneuvering um, absolutely accurately. So the stage can be recaptured and returned. We, I've already mentioned that we uh, can put in a, a passenger module that can carry 20-odd passengers uh, to an in, uh, international space station. Uh, my colleague Mark Hempsler has put a, a lot of uh, uh, study into that. And we think that we could fly uh, research laboratories um, on uh, specialized missions. We have looked at a stage which we call the flute stage. I'm told that a flute is a Dutch... Uh, barge of some description. I didn't think of the name, so don't blame me. Um, and the flute stage is uh, essentially using the Vinci engine, which is being developed in Europe at the present time, 
again liquid hydrogen, liquid oxygen, so it's common with the uh, uh, Skylon vehicle and with, with hydrogen to pressurise the stage. And there you can see the hydrogen tank uh, in the Skylon payload bay. It arrives on orbit uh, uh, in the propulsion module and LOX tank, the hydrogen tank, and of course uh, payload being conveniently labelled payload. And uh, that, of course, assembles into a uh, 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 orbit transfer vehicle configuration. To go beyond Earth orbit, one of the things that we looked at, mainly to make sure we were getting Skylon right, uh, was could we do a Mars mission? And the answer is you use Skylon to uh, ferry into orbit modules of various bits and pieces for assembly on orbit, and then put together this whole stage, uh, essentially in this orbital uh, base station, as we call it, which is an orbital assembly facility to keep captive all of those bits in the Von Braun slide. Skylons would regularly ferry to that. A Skylon can be turned around in about two days. So a Skylon could ferry a payload to this base station, land, it could uh, go through its checks, be refilled two days later, it could be back up there with another payload. Uh, 522 payloads would get you three vehicles together, which uh, could then give you a, a vehicle like this, which you could fly three of uh, to do a Columbus type mission to Mars. And here you can see a ferry vehicle using carbon monoxide and liquid oxygen as propellants. Uh, conveniently, you can make those out of the Martian atmosphere using a nuclear electric plant. And therefore, we have looked at the possibility of expanding. We've looked at a mission flown in uh, 2028, uh, because it's a quiet sun in 2028. Um, but uh, I personally think this is probably going to be uh, middle of the century rather than uh, the first quarter of the century. Let me come to some conclusions then. Um, we require uh, a low-cost and reusable uh, transportation system, not just the space plane, but uh, all the elements. But it's quite clear that the reusable launch vehicle is the most difficult step. It's the so-called von Perke paradox, that the most difficult step of getting anywhere in the universe is getting off the Earth's surface. And although this 10% too big is a curse, we're fortunate that it's not 50% too big or bigger. Otherwise, we'd really have a problem. Skylon will, I'm quite convinced, transform how we use space and how we access it. The space-faring nations of the world at the moment, uh, Japan, India, America, etc., the Europeans, are continuing to design more and more expendable launches, and uh, you can see that the Americans have just backtracked even from some of that. The actual aircraft industries, the Boeings, the Lockheeds of this world, are obsessed with uh, scramjets, despite the immense technical problems. But of course, they have a vested interest in building more of these expendable vehicles, and they're not going to be short of research funds for a long time to come. The pre-cooled engine is here. It's not something in the distant future. It will get us to Mach 5, and I've already shown you that uh, on the uh, rocket equation basis, Mach 5 gives us a very, very good uh, leg up into orbit. We in the UK, and this is going to be my only political statement uh, tonight, oh sorry, I mentioned Kenneth Clark, but that's not a political statement, it's a personal one. Um, we alone in the UK have got the technology to do this. And I'm very pleased to say that in recent uh, times, we have had a very, very positive attitude from not only uh, the British National Space Agency, but from the European Space Agency. Uh, Reaction Engines has just done a trade mission to the States, and we've had very, very positive reactions from the United States as well. But there are problems with dealing with the United States because of the uh, international uh, trade and arms uh, uh, regulations, and it doesn't look as though we will be able to involve the United States in the development of this vehicle. So on that point then, I just want to sort of say uh, I'm very indebted to everyone at Reaction Engines. We've now grown to about 35 people. Um, they are so devoted to all of this that uh, 
words fail me to express uh, that. Uh, we couldn't have done this without private investment. Uh, Anthony Evans, Paul Portelli, who sadly is no longer with us, and Nigel McNair Scott, <coughs> who was also inspired by Project Daedalus. And the reason that he has been prepared to support this is from a, a study that was done a long, long time ago, 40 years ago, and uh, he, he's quite happy to uh, support what we're doing. And of late, I, I need to say that the BNSC have been outstanding, and especially Ian Gibson, who retires at the end of this month, uh, but I'm pleased to say he's leaving quite a number of disciples behind him, and so I think that the support that we get there uh, will continue. And that's it. Engineers like Mr. Bond and those who dream big give us hope that one day spacecraft like this can be a reality. Something to think about. Thanks for listening and stay safe at Astro Proterra.